We are at session eight of our series on battling unbelief. And the angle we are taking is the assumption that the biblical pathway to love and the biblical pathway to holiness and the biblical path to sin killing is belief, believing God's promises. And therefore, we must battle unbelief in order to establish these three, which we showed were so essential to the Christian life. And we are pointing out how particular kinds of sins have their roots in unbelief. And if we can identify the kind of belief, the kind of promises that we could lay hold of and embrace that would overcome the sins, in this case, impatience, then we would be able to establish the love and the holiness of patience. So, Father, as we tackle the unbelief of impatience, the kinds of doubtings and not believing that lies behind the sin of impatience, grant that we would see your word clearly, understand it truly, and make great progress in becoming a patient people through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's start with a definition. Impatience is a loss of contentment in God owing to our plan not proceeding as we had hoped. And you can think of something as simple as a traffic jam or half your life being ruined by someone's death. So the loss of contentment is what impatience is, and it's the particular kind of contentment that comes when the plan that we had is interrupted, ruined, whether small plan or little plan, and it simply isn't proceeding as we had dreamed in the big case or as we had hoped in the little case. And this loss of contentment could become great bitterness. But what we're thinking now is just the whole range of what impatience involves. So how do we battle it? Impatience. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, if it's a fruit of the Spirit, is there anything that we can do to pursue it? This, this means the Spirit brings about, ultimately, patience, right? It's, it's a fruit it's not a performance that we do. It's a, it's a fruit that he bears. So how do we engage in experiencing the fruit of the Spirit? I think the answer is given in chapter 3, verse 5 of Galatians. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you? So the Spirit supplied to you for the purpose of producing fruit Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, and that may include uh, extraordinary miracles like healing, but it also may include, and I think does, miracles like (laughs) patience in an impatient person. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law? And the answer is no. Or does he do it by hearing with faith? And the answer is yes. Now, hearing what? Well, hearing the gospel or hearing what was secured for us in the gospel, namely all the promises of God, (laughs) are yes in Jesus. So hearing all of the promises purchased by the blood of Jesus with faith. So, the way the Holy Spirit is supplied to you in this patient-producing, patience-producing power is when we hear and believe 
the promises of God. Now, what kind of promises? 2 Corinthians 4.16 We do not lose heart, which is so easy to do when our the pace of our lives is not at all what we planned. Though our outer nature is wasting away, so here we are languishing in the hospital, say, or getting old, and this isn't what we planned. And our inner self is being renewed day by day. How's that going to happen? For this light momentary affliction, now he's talking about a lifetime here. It's light and it's momentary. And it's affliction, getting in the way of all our plans, messing up life according to what we had hoped. It is preparing for us an eternal, which corresponds to momentary or contrasts with momentary, weight, which contrasts with light, is heavy and it's eternal, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, that's a promise. And how, how do we conquer the unbelief of impatience when affliction is getting in the way of all our plans? First, we realize that in comparison to eternity, they are momentary. In comparison to the weight of glory that's coming, they're light. And indeed, these are coming. There is a glory coming, and this affliction is preparing it. It's not neutral. This is not aimless. It's preparing this. That's what's so amazing. And we have to believe that. If we don't believe that, we're going to murmur and grumble in impatience. As we look not to the things that are seen, because if we look just to the things that are seen, we're going to say, I had some plans, and they've been ruined, and that's all I can see but to the things that are unseen, the eternal weight of glory. For the things that are seen are transient. They're like this momentary here. But the things that are unseen are eternal, namely the weight of glory. We have to become so saturated with this glorious truth that we trust God with these afflictions and that they are preparing for us something way better than the plan that we had. Now, I have found in my own life and in counseling other people that the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 to 50 is perhaps the most um, provocative, helpful, insightful illustration of the need for patience and how we can have it. Let me just tell you the story. And then I'll give you the place here where you can look them up. In chapter 37, verse 5, Joseph's brothers hate him because he's having these dreams that one day they're going to bow down to him. He's 17 years old. In 37, 24, they throw him into a pit intended to kill him. In 37, 28, they sold him instead of killing him into slavery, into Egypt. And what you should be watching here is that he's going down, 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 down. And at every point, you can imagine yourself in his shoes saying, I don't get it, God. I don't get it, God. I don't get it, God. This is not my plan. This is getting worse and worse. 39, 17, Potiphar's wife, he was working for a man named Potiphar, and his wife accused him of abuse and lied about him. 39.20, Potiphar believes her, not him, throws him in prison. 40.23, Pharaoh's cupbearer uh, gets a dream told about him, and he says, please remember me when you're restored to your office, and he forgets him for two more years. And then finally, in 41.40, he is elevated to prince over Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. And then in chapter 45, Verse 6, his brothers, these rascals who sold him into slavery, come to Egypt desperate for food because there's a great famine, and Joseph has been chosen to handle the food of Egypt. He is now 39 years old. That's 22 years of inexplicable hardship. Even in his role as prince, he doesn't know what's going on. He had a people once. Now, here come the two explanatory verses. First, 45, 7, and 8, and then 50, 20. God sent me here before you 
God sent me, he says to his brothers, before you to preserve you a remnant on the earth so they wouldn't starve. This is the people for whom the Messiah is coming. This is all about the preservation of God's people and the accomplishment of his purposes to save the earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, really. They did sail him into Egypt, not ultimately, but God, God, God was behind all that. I mean, the, the, every bit of this is sin, right? He's being mistreated all the way, hated, killed, slavery, lying accusations, prison when he didn't deserve it, being forgotten. It's all evil. And this says God was the one who was behind all of that. Can you handle that? God doesn't sin, but he may ordain that things come about which are happening through sin. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. So God sent me here. That's what we have to believe about our 22 years of unplanned life. Here's the summary of it. This is a great verse to put over all your hardships, indeed all the evils of the world. As for you, you brothers of mine, you sinners against me, you haters, haters of me, you meant it, you meant evil against me. And indeed it was against me. You did evil and intended evil, but God meant it. Don't say used it. It's not what it says. And I've heard people paraphrase this over and over again. They meant it for evil. God used it for good. No, this is the same word as this word right here. God had a meaning. They had a meaning. God had an intention. They had an intention. And through their intention, God's intention is fulfilled. God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So, this is absolutely crucial that we believe. Do we believe this about our interruptions in life? People hurt us. They mean evil against us. They ruin our plans. And in and through that, since God works all things together for our good, that's Romans eight twenty eight. God meant it for good, and we should look for the good. Let me end with these two obvious statements. Isaiah 64, 4, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who works or acts for those who wait for him. We have to trust God and wait patiently for him. And when we do, he loves to work for us. He's in a class by himself Lamentations 3.25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, the soul who seeks him. So waiting is a huge part of the Christian life, and it involves seeking him and trusting him with the pace of our lives. So I conclude. We kill the sin of impatience by believing, as always, God's promises that God's purpose in changing our plans is wise and good. That is, we kill the sin of impatience by being satisfied. We don't lose contentment in God because we trust Him. Being satisfied with all that God promises to be for us and do for us when and how He chooses. This is the great battle to be satisfied in God through Jesus Christ.